I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the Webby-nominated podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This episode has been sponsored by Lauren Gabrielson, which is a women's wear brand that creates elevated essentials for the modern women's wardrobe. The collection is entirely designed and produced in Brooklyn, New York. The Lauren Gabrielson woman values quality, versatile pieces that she can wear every day that are customized to her body, her time, and her style. And by the way, I have two Lauren Gabrielson headbands, which I wear all the time, and you can see in my photos on my events page because I wear them everywhere, and they're amazing, and actually my six-year-old daughter steals mine all the time. So anyway, laurengabrielson.com. This is a really special episode that I'm introducing now. Um, It was Deborah Keegan's idea to get all these people in a room together and put everyone on my podcast. And I'll explain why. Uh, Deborah, who I'll introduce in a second, wrote an article for the Modern Love column in the New York Times, which was then published by Daniel Jones, the editor of the Modern Love column. The column was about a couple, Justin McLeod, who's the founder and CEO of the dating app Hinge, and his now wife, uh, Kate McLeod, who's the founder of The Body Stone. So everybody got together in my office here, and we all talked about how the essay has now been put in a book that's a collection of essays, also called Modern Love, True Stories of Love, Loss, and Redemption, which just came out. And this episode, this essay has actually been made into one episode of the new Amazon streaming series um, of the same name, which is debuting on October 18th. Does that make any sense to anybody? Anyway, there are, are a lot of people on this podcast. It is so exciting and fun. I wish you had all been in the room because There was such love emanating between Justin and Kate, so much energy. Daniel Jones of the New York Times is such a genius that he even edited the bio I wrote about him with excruciating detail. And Deborah Kopakin has been one of my favorite authors since she wrote Shudder Babe almost 20 years ago. And meeting her in person was just amazing. And our correspondence since has been, oh my gosh, she's just incredible and um, one of the brightest stars in the writing world there is. So let me read their bios and then hopefully you can enjoy this really unique conversation. Um, And then you can buy the book Modern Love and you can watch this whole um, experience come to life on Amazon when it airs uh, October 18th. Okay, so Daniel Jones is the editor of the New York Times Modern Love column and the author editor of books Modern Love, 50 True and Extraordinary Tales of Desire, Deceit, and Devotion, Love Illuminated, exploring life's most mystifying subject with the help of 50,000 strangers, The Bastard on the Couch, and his now most recent Modern Love True Stories of Love, Loss, and Redemption. His Modern Love column has been turned into a long-running podcast and now an Amazon streaming series that will debut on October 18th. Deborah Kopakin is the New York Times bestselling author of Shutter Babe, Hell is Other Parents, Between Here and April, The Red Book, and the ABCs of Adulthood. She is a former award-winning war photographer, an Emmy-winning producer, and a columnist of the Financial Times, The Observer, and The Atlantic. She's currently a staff writer on Darren Starr's new show, Emily in Paris. Her upcoming memoir, Lady Parts, comes out in 2021. She wrote the essay in the Modern Love column called When Cupid is a Prying Journalist in November 2015. FYI, Catherine Keener is now playing her in the show. Justin McLeod is the founder and CEO of the dating app Hinge, which was acquired by Match and which, according to Vogue, everyone under 40 in the UK appears to be on. He graduated from Colgate College and Harvard Business School. Being reunited with his college sweetheart is not only being made into this Amazon TV series episode, but also a film by Mason Novick, who did Juno and 500 Days of Summer. Kate McLeod is the co-founder and formulator of Kate McLeod and the Body Stone, a moisturizer in the shape of a stone that dissolves with your skin on contact. She moved the operation out of her living room and opened the Butter Atelier in Dumbo, Brooklyn. A former bakery owner, pastry chef, and Goldman Sachs exec, Kate graduated from Wellesley College and the Courteau Institute. So that's everybody. And now enjoy while we all got together. I think I asked one question and listen to this incredible true story unfold and let it inspire you the way it did all of us in the room. All right. So welcome, everybody. I have a whole group here (laughs) today on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Do you want to introduce yourselves? I've never done like a So Many People podcast. A a panel. I'm Deb Kopakin, and I wrote the article for the Modern Love Story. I'm Justin McLeod, founder of Hinge interviewee in the (laughs) modern love story. (laughs) I'm Kate McLeod. I have a company that makes 
body moisturizers, but I also called off a wedding and came back from my first love, Justin, because of this whole modern love story, which we'll get to. And I'm Dan Jones, the editor of the Modern Love Column and the New York Times. And I had a, a glimpse at the editing after Dan tore apart the bio I wrote about him. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, maybe it's because he's the editor at this major column at a major newspaper, but I, now I'm totally embarrassed by my comments or whatever else I did wrong. <laughs> so anyway. That's okay. That's okay. I can take it. I'm good with it. Okay. So who wants to jump in and tell the story of what happened? Justin, why don't you start and I'll fill in and... Sure, I can start. Well, I don't even know where to begin, really. I mean, I guess I'll start in the middle. Okay. <laughs> in media's race, as yeah, they say. Yeah, in media's race, which is that this really started because I was running Hinge back in 2014, and I got a call from, or an email, I guess, from and I Deborah. Remember. And asking, I think you wanted, you were looking for like I was looking for a stories. job or a story. No, I was looking for, I was looking for <laughs> both. Was like, at the time, I just got in that job at, 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 at what was it called, cafe.com, that just then became the mid.com, that then sort of blew up. Yeah. But I needed to produce a story every single day. So I was like, okay, what are we going to write about today? Well, I met this amazing guy on Hinge. Like, why don't I just interview the CEO of Hinge? Because that would be a fun story. How did you start your dating app? So we met. In yeah, and you came to me and you're like, well, I downloaded this app and the first guy who popped up for me, I matched with and now we're in love. And like, how did you figure this out? Like, what did you, what did you do? And I, you know, I don't know. I was lucky. I got lucky. <laughs> and so we had like a great interview. It was like very standard about, you know, the founding of Hinge and how we got here. And we were wrapping up and I think you were getting up to just kind of. I had to uh, go pick up my kid at school. And yeah. I was like, oh, I got to go. Shoot. Yeah. And. She asked this one final question, which was, have you ever been in love? And it was like a throwaway question. I think she was like running out the door. And I was like, well, once a long time ago, but I didn't recognize it until it was too late. And so she kind of stopped and turns and and she asked me to tell her the story. And so I told her the story of Kate, of my college girlfriend that I was totally in love with. And, uh, and I it sort of screwed it up because I had a very sordid past of <laughs> <laughs> drugs and alcohol and all kinds of uh, <laughs> rehabs. And it was a wild story. And I kind of just, at the end of it all, told Kate to sort of save herself and run away, which she wisely did. And then four years later, after I'd like cleaned up my act, I had reached back out to her while I was in business school. And she politely declined my... <laughs> my I reached out to her to say, like, you know, come back to, or at least let's meet up, right? You were living in London at this time. She's a Kate had moved, it's, it's such a long story, but Kate had moved to London and I had reached out to her and she said no and I was heartbroken and sort of Deborah pulled out of me that really Kate was the reason for Hinge. I mean, I was heartbroken and then the idea for Hinge spawned a, a few weeks later and and that was it. And, and I said to you at the time, I was like, you just emailed her? Like, that's not, if you really love her, you got to go after her. And then I told him the story of this guy that I was dating back in 1989 who I met in Jamaica. And then we spent a beautiful week in, in London together. And then he was supposed to show up in Paris and never showed up. And I thought he'd stood me up. And I found out 20 years later because that was back in the day before email and Facebook and like being able to keep track of people that he had showed up in Paris, but didn't have, like it lost the piece of paper with oh. my phone number on it and ended up staying at a youth hostel all weekend. <laughs> and like, I know, it's so sad. <laughs> so when when this this young man and I met up 20 years later, both married with three kids and you know, love doesn't go away, right? It just is there. And so I told him the story and I said, if you love her, don't end up like me 20 years later regretting not going after this person. I mean, I thought I was stood up, but like, just put your body where your beliefs are. And thank you for that. (laughs) (laughs) You know, we had Justin kind of jumped over it, but it had been a very... It had been like four years of many back and forths and even on my part, a transfer of universities just to like get my life back together. Because when love happens and it's true and it's real like that, it can really just render you. I was so distraught emotionally, I couldn't get anything done. And so when he had come back after four years of silence, I just thought, I can't trust this. I can't do it again. And I needed a little bit more of a grand gesture. I needed to know he was really serious. And I was afraid to do that because 
you know, having screwed it up so many times before, mm-hmm. really putting yourself out there. It wasn't so much, well, I guess it was my, I mean, in retrospect, it really was my risk, but it was the risk of hurting her again that I was afraid to, like, put myself out there so much because then she would maybe actually come back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you'd have to deal with and intimacy. Then would, yeah, <laughs> and then I would screw it up again. And I think that was the big fear for me. And so you told me to go over there. And I'm like, listen, you know, crazy lady. It's been <laughs> seven years and she's getting married in a couple of months. And really it's, you know, she like lives in over in Europe and it's just, it's too late. And you're like, it's never too late. You gotta go. It's never too late. And also, she'd been engaged for two years. I was like, that's yeah, a long that's engagement. That's yeah. yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, I was, Justin sent this one final email in February of 2015. And it said, he actually thought I still lived in London. I was living in Switzerland at the time. And he said, I can't believe I'm never going to see you again. I'm going to be in London launching Hinge next week meet me for coffee, just 15 minutes, hello, goodbye. And I got it, and I just, something in me, I had never stopped thinking about Justin. I really hadn't. A quick interjection, which is that I, after that one time I reached out and she said no, then I would write her at least every year on her birthday to, uh, and sometimes it would be like, oh, you know, I can be friends now, like maybe we can be friends, and then the next one would be like, I'll come over to London with an engagement <laughs> ring, like anything. Oh, wow. And I was yeah. always summarily ignored. I didn't even know whether she was getting them. Like, maybe she just blocked me. Of I didn't I know. Was getting them. Until, <laughs> until I sent the engagement one, at which point I got blocked on all forms of social media. So I did not. And let's just, I'm going to cut in there just one of them. <laughs> because the thing is, basically, when we finally split up, I kind of came to this internal realization that, or I just assumed that the love wasn't reciprocated. And that what you should look for in life is a really good friendship and partnership, but anything that passionate is going to blow up. And that's just, you know, avoid, avoid that. Um, And so I met someone when I came to New York and we are really good friends and we were together for seven years. And the reason that none of these emails were responded to is we did have that one point of communication in 2010, we had one phone call. And then after that, whenever I would get one of these emails, I would actually open them up with my ex and we would read them together because oh. I did not want there to be any secrets. I remember telling him about that first phone call and I remember saying, okay, like this is a relationship. I didn't want to hide things. So if I get contacted again, we're a team. Let's open this together and we'll read it together. And then you wouldn't respond? No, I, I didn't respond. Thank and God so, Kate didn't know how to block emails. <laughs> 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 He's the tech one. <laughs> and, like, but after that email that he did send, I think it was in like 2013, that said, you know, I really, I would come over with an engagement ring. My ex was getting ready to propose. And that one really struck a chord. And yeah, you were blocked. <laughs> um, <laughs> I never stopped thinking about him though. And it did start to dawn on me that maybe this wasn't as one-sided as I thought it had been all of that time. And I was approaching my wedding. And the thing that really bothered me was that I was still thinking. There was this nagging, it was like this little thing in the back of my mind that kept cropping up. I was still thinking of this other person. So when I did get that last email, and for anyone listening, that little gurgling noise is our baby who's five years old. I'm gonna say that. Uh, I didn't want to give away the ending. <laughs> it turns um, out we ended up together. Okay, there <laughs> When I got that email, there was just something that went off in my head that was like, you know what? This one's for me. It's the only one I didn't share, and it's the only one I responded Mm. to. Mm. And I, yeah. And that was that. Well, I mean, (laughs) sort of. I mean, there's obviously a lot more that happened. And and what happened on on my end was, it was a couple months later, and I was out at dinner. And as I was walking out of this dinner in New York, I happened, as I was walking out of the restaurant— out of the corner of my eye, I saw Kate's best friend from college, who I hadn't seen in forever. And I walked over and we started chatting and we ended up uh, walking out together. It was raining, so we caught a cab together towards the West Village. And we were talking about Kate. And so I got out of the car and I like went upstairs and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna send like one last email, even though you know I've been blocked on social media and she never responds to my emails. And that was that email. And when I 
And I woke up the next morning and I had a response. I, it, I, I mean, it was like. What did she say? She said, DM me on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I was so hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> oh, I had a food line. So romantic. <laughs> Well, I'm really going to be honest and all of this comes out here. Like, you know, in wanting to, like, not hide anything from my ex, I think I, I he became a little paranoid and would check my emails. Mm. Anyway, moving on from that, I had a food blog back at the time. And food pictures were becoming really big on Instagram. And I just discovered, like, these direct messages. And now I am sure that many illicit affairs go on on DMs, on Instagram. But that was the only method of communication that I thought was going to be, like, completely safe. And so I sent (laughs) my name and... Yeah. And yeah. And we started chatting a little back it, and forth, it was and she's like, like we "Well, never stopped." Yeah. And well, I mean, we started chatting a little bit, and you're like, "I can't talk on this thing," and let's blow up my push notifications. And she's like, "Just, I'll talk to you this weekend. Um, I'm gonna be on my own. Uh, he's traveling for work, so I'll, I'll like talk to you this weekend. You can call me this weekend." And then, like, Deborah's voice, like, flashes in my head, which is that, like, you've got to do regret. something. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so I literally, I think it was a, it was a Thursday morning, and I just literally, uh, just, like, in the movies, like, drove yeah. to the airport, like, asked for a ticket to Switzerland and got on the next plane and took uh-huh. a red eye. Wow. And I have to say, like, imagine, it's a February morning in Zurich. Zurich's this, like, stunningly beautiful city, and the mountains are all around, and it was cold. And yeah, I was really excited to chat with him. And I remember that morning I got up early and I downloaded the vow and the notebook. And And this is true. And this is like, this is me. And I literally was like all cuddled in bed in my pajamas, like drinking cocoa. And I sent him a message like, I am ready to talk when you are. And it was almost instant. I got, I'm here. And I was like, what do you mean you're here? You're here like you're ready to speak? Or he was like, no, I just landed. And you didn't know he was flying? No, I said I would speak to him on Friday morning. Wow. Not in person. That's quite a move. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) That's a grand gesture. Well, I think I know. I was taking the advice. Yeah. Yeah. I think I almost broke a tooth tripping to get into the tub to, like, clean myself up. And, yeah. (laughs) And then, like, a few weeks later, he calls me up and he says, oh, I wanted to take you out. What was it, like, Gotham? Um, Not a few weeks later. Like, literally the next day. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, I want to take you out for lunch. I send send you an email. And we were together. I didn't know you were together. And we just already decided that, like, Kate's coming back to America. (laughs) So (laughs) it took us all of, like, a day. So we sat down at a cafe (laughs) and basically we didn't get up for eight hours wow. and they were super sweet we didn't even order water and we just sat there talking I mean yeah so we yeah I guess we skipped over that but I so I I let her know I've landed and she's like well where are we meeting we're in meeting and I'm like I need to first of all I'd like I didn't sleep at all on the plane because I was so nervous I was like throwing up in the bathroom it was just like <laughs> oh not it wasn't like super romantic and so I was like I need to go to a hotel and like sleep for a moment I'll meet you this afternoon and I I gotta say, like, part of it was a grand gesture, but honestly, part of it was just closure. Like, she was getting married in a month, and I, I was gonna ask, where's the fiance in during the stretch? Well, were you living he, together? Yes, he was out of town this weekend, and I had never done mm. anything like this before. But we had our own problems, yeah. and whether or not Justin and I were going to work out or still going to work out, like, it's it's actually a completely separate thing. Yeah. But no, it, it was, we'll get there, but it, it's hard and there is, there's yeah. human feelings no, involved here. I remember in that essay that Deb, one of your reactions was, poor guy. Yeah. Poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, started this whole thing in motion and then you're like. Then you feel bad guy. about it, yeah. 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 But you know what? I just, I don't know. I could just tell. Yeah. Also, didn't you read the article, like the silly article I wrote in Cafe.com? Not until we started speaking and then he actually did send it to oh, okay. me. And it, but it was. Things like that were so deeply meaningful to me and did carry so much gravitas and weight because I still didn't believe that he could be really serious about this. And so, yeah, he called me or he texted me, let me know he was in Zurich. We picked a cafe. And 
I cannot tell you what it feels like, the energy coursing through your body when you've dreamt of someone for eight years. It was two weeks shy of eight years to the day since we'd seen each other. And you're sitting at a cafe and you look up out the window and there that person is walking across the street. Like, I just can't even go in, like what that does to your body. And he came up and I'll never forget, he walked in and he looked up at me and we made eye contact and he came over and he hugged me and I have, I'm literally like goose pumping out right now. <laughs> and I, I think I actually had to push you away. Like I couldn't physically take it. It was too much. And I could just like feel the energy running between us. It was. And uh, I, I mean, as I was about to say, it was like, I, I was like, I've changed so so much in eight years. I'm sure she's changed so much. Like we're just oh like God. idealizing each other. I'm idealizing her at the you very were least. Like the last time you were together, you were undergraduates the last time you were. Basically, together. yeah. We were. I was one. I was one year out, and she was at her. She was in her senior year. Wow. And yeah, I just, we've changed so much. Like we're gonna see each other, and we're gonna like laugh this off. And <laughs> I'm gonna go on to London, <laughs> do the hinge launch party, and and finally get closure and move on with my life. And yeah, that's just not, that's just not what happened. Like, <laughs> oh I just knew within like three minutes of sitting down and hanging out that like, what have I been doing with my life? Like I, yeah. Aww. And this is so sweet. I feel like this is like a When Harry Met Sally, you know, the couch, like they always totally. have those little scenes. <laughs> I feel like I'm just sitting here in my like living room watching that movie, like yeah. right here. It's amazing. So yeah, so that was that. And we sat down and. I was like, how did it happen? And we were sitting there, and she's like, well, obviously, I'm not calling off the wedding. It's, like, a month away, so, but we'll stay in touch. And and then, like, a few hours later, it was like, well, if I were going to call off the wedding. <laughs> 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 and then I think by the end of it, it was just like, okay, well, I think I'm calling off the wedding. And and then the next day, we, we sent Deborah an email, and I'm like, I have a funny story for you. Let's get together for lunch next week. It wasn't Back even, at, it was much less, like, explicit than that. It was more like, hey, I'd like to just have yeah, lunch with you. I, like, I remember this. We were like, you were like, I'm just going to tell her, like, let's catch up. Yeah, no, no. Like, you said, I want to thank you for publishing the article. We got a lot of interest in the app. And I was like, oh, this happens every once in a while as a journalist. Yeah. You get invited, you yeah. know, to, to have a post-article publishing lunch. And so I walked up to the Mitre D and I said, oh, I'm meeting Justin McLeod here. So it's table for two. And he comes like running behind me. He's like, no, 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 table for three. And I thought, oh, he's bringing a publicist or something like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> but then he said, I said, three, who are you talking about? And he goes, her. And look at her hair. Like she was running because she was late. Her, like this beautiful strawberry blonde hair running by the window in a pink coat. I will never forget <laughs> that image ever. That it was, and I just started crying. Aww. You're not even giving yourself enough credit because actually you, and you immediately, like I said table for three and you turned and you were like, no. And then you just started crying. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and, then, and then we sat down and Kate like ran around the corner. I and- cried the whole lunch. <laughs> the whole lunch. Say, like, all, all of you have such Hollywood impulses in your pockets. I know, right? <laughs> the average person would not hold that information. Like, they would email the person and say, this is what happened, this is the story. They wouldn't save it for, like... Right. That moment. It's so cinematic. And even in the, in the essay itself, that was sort of... One of these moments, like, when I'm editing a piece and I'm reading it, and it's like... This isn't, even if it happened this way, it's not believable. <laughs> so we may need to do some work here. Like, like the scene when, when you are gathering at the restaurant and the timing of that and all that, I'm like, it's just not believable. It's, <laughs> it's not and, like, yet. and yet. And yet, I know. Yeah, Stranger than fiction for was. sure. Yeah. I know. But even in my head, I said, oh, there was three weeks between the time that you emailed me. But no, it was the, from Switzerland? It was from Switzerland. Oh it was from God. Switzerland. I'm like, I'm going to eat, like, Deborah's going to love this. <laughs> oh, my God. Totally. <laughs> and then I went back to my office and I told them this amazing story and then I got fired. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, no. Scary Mommy, your friend. Oh, yeah. I didn't say it was my okay. friend. <laughs> <laughs> Scary Mommy. I had, said I like, wrote one article for that. So the, the, at cafe.com became the mid.com, and then we bought Scary Mommy, and then she became our editor. And, like, soon after that, she calls me, and she said, you know, Deb, every time I read one of your stories, I just want to dumb it down and make it shorter. And so I was like, oh, I guess that's not going to work for me. That's not, I don't want to... So I essentially, well, whatever. I don't know if I got fired or we just had a difference of opinion. And so I was going to write the story of their getting back together for the mid.com. And instead, 
I had to get a new job because I didn't have a job anymore and I was going to work for the Observer. But then my boss was sexually harassing me. And so I ended up at this horrible PR firm, which I'm not going to say the name of, but that was where I was working as a vice president at a PR firm and writing on the subway there because I had an hour commute. So I like you, you know, you asked me, where did I write this article on the friggin' subway to my my other job? Unbelievable. (laughs) Yeah. And then you just sent it. I sent it to Dan. But Dan and I had worked together. I had done One Other Modern Love and... And that first Modern Love, we did the edit while I was literally on the floor of a hospital about to go in for an appendectomy. And and Dan was like, are you, are you okay? Shouldn't you call someone, like, besides me? <laughs> anyway, so I knew Dan, and I just, I just he was the first person I thought of because it was a love story, right? It's, it's a love story. And so... A modern love story. A modern <laughs> love story. <laughs> Several times over. And I sent it to you, and you can tell the rest. And then, and then what happened? Well, yeah, so Modern Love has a lot of submissions, maybe... Eight or nine thousand a year, and it takes us months and months to get through them. Um, but in Deb's case, it you know we'd worked together before, and she's a pro. You know, <laughs> she knows a good story when she sees one. So I don't know how long. I, I don't remember how long it took me to get to it, but I don't think it was that long. And, yeah. But I love these stories that have it's the movie about sliding doors or whatever. Yeah, it's it these favorite. missed opportunities, and this had two of them playing off each other and informing each other. And there were parts about it that just, you know, they were true but unbelievable in a way, like I said before, that it just, the ways that it worked and sort of grand gesture. A lot of what I see today in stories that are submitted is this um, feeling that that kind of romance is lost, that, that we're sort of, we sort of moved beyond that kind of, you know, no one wants to be vulnerable in the way that Justin was describing, <laughs> that he would have to be vulnerable if he was going to do this. and. Um, there are too many ways to, to protect ourselves from that. Like technology was supposed to be the, the shortcut to love, and instead it's sort of like the armor against love in a lot of ways. Or we, that's what we do it with it, with our phones and all that. And so there's this, but there's this incredible yearning for, mm-hmm. for connection and a sense of romance and a sense of grand gesture and really taking a risk, you know, like taking a risk. So this story had had all of that and it was just sort of a joy but it also had it made sense of itself you know Deb talking about sort of how love from the past that that sort of eternal quality of when that you have that connection doesn't really go away it may change forms or it may be passed along (laughs) to somebody else so there's just a lot there was a lot going on in the story and I don't some pieces I had a lot I don't remember that this needed to be worked on a lot. I know we talked about it and um, did some work to get it in shape. Um, but the real joy was seeing it seeing it picked for this Amazon series and seeing it with some changes, seeing it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> turning, turning Justin into the hero instead of the goat. You know? Um, I know, it's crazy. With some changes, it, it's come, sort of come to life and it's going to be seen by a lot of people in about three weeks. So exciting. Did you, he, get, did you get to pick the eight stories on which the series was... No, that was also a process that involved the, the producers and the Amazon studio executives, and um, we all read... Well, I, I'm the only one who sort of knows the whole archive of Modern Love, at least mostly, um, most readily, and John Carney, who's the showrunner for the series, he, he probably read five or 600 essays. Wow. Like, he really read mm. a lot, and then we shared lists of essays that we thought would be good for the series and and it just sort of boiled down and boiled down and boiled down until it had this sort of nice combination of eight essays but this one was one of the most promising it was also one of the hardest to put together because it was it was two current stories and then two past stories Mm -hmm. that i think were just like each episode took six days of shooting and which isn't a lot so they had to do these sort of two life stories in six days and then figure out how to edit them together in a way that was dramatic and told told the whole thing and and they meant you know they made some shortcuts and made some changes from the real story to make that happen but it made me weep when i finally saw the final i i cried too he showed it to, so i got called into the new york times the other day and dan said i'm going to show you the story and he was interviewing me at the same time and i just i broke 
you know, the story is so different and so similar, meaning yeah. the truth of the story was kept. Yeah. And seeing that truth on screen, I, you know, I was weeping seeing yeah. it. It's really good. Emotional. I know. We Do we get to see this? Thing because <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> no, not only that. Can we? Just, I'll just tell you really quick that we were. Uh, Deborah called me when one day randomly. I thought randomly in in New York. And, it was randomly, yeah. Yeah, randomly, and she's like, um, so. Our story, apparently <laughs> Amazon is, is partnered with the New York Times and they're turning modern love into this anthology. I'm like, oh, cool. And she's like, oh, yeah. And also your story is the pilot. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. She's like, also, it's being filmed right now in <laughs> Gowanus. <laughs> and today's the last day of shooting. And I'm like... Really? And she's like, also, Deb Patel is playing you. <laughs> and so I call Kate. I'm like, Kate, um, weird news. Uh, but <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm going. And so I hopped in an Uber, and I walked up on the set, and it was like, a massive set. There are like 150 <laughs> people here and they're and, throwing the and like. like, who are you? And I'm like, I think this is my story. <laughs> they, we sort of like snuck in as extras. I don't know whether we made it into the final cut or not, but we tried to. We're in the and front row of the, the, of the launch, launch party. party. Of, they changed the name of Hinge to Fuse and we were at the Fuse launch party <laughs> watching, you know, Dev Patel like <laughs> up on stage launching my app. So it was, uh, yeah, that was a surreal experience. Another oh, yeah. made for all your moment. I on my laptop and could show it to you. Um, Wait, yes. Do you really? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're turning off the podcast. How much is to you? But I think talking about the truth and like what was preserved and just touching on, and Justin can really jump in here because he's massively against, you know, digital addiction and what goes on. But that vulnerability and that I even just being on the set and getting the gist of what the episode was going to be about. I know that that was kept and that that risk that we both had to take of like, let's take down the walls. Let's see if we could like, see if something's still there. Yeah. And I think what was what was so unique about our connection is that and I mean, at least for me, but Justin was my first love. So when we first connected back in 2004, was when we really started dating, I didn't have any walls up. And we did just get to know each other. And all of that just did flow out. And when you connect with someone on that level and you really share yourself and you, it's more than just dating, it's a friendship. It's, it's human connection. And I do think we're lacking that in today's world. I think Deb's crying and again. I am just like, well, I was just thinking, like, I just moved in with my boyfriend into their neighborhood. <laughs> so now I literally run into them on the street. Yeah. She's and it's just, you know, and I came up, I came over. The day, oh I came over the day after they had their baby. And it was like two days later, maybe, whatever. And I'm like, I'm bringing my camera. And I shot some photos. And just, I, it's still weirdly overwhelming to to feel that this love affair that happened back in 1989 that didn't get a chance to live somehow lives on in that like little baby in this room. You know, it's just, it's, it's overwhelming. And not just there, but I mean, I think the other relevant thing is that I was running a, one, well, I was running a dating app at the time. <laughs> and so because of this whole story, and I was running this app that was, it was, a, it was just a swiping app. It was just another one of those like, like vulnerability shield swiping mm -hmm. app things and and this experience yeah. because of you because of us taught me that like love isn't a volume game it's not about like finding your perfect puzzle piece it's about opening it's like softening your edges so that influences how you design oh totally and i came and so our love story and i was like this is so wrong this is so wrong what we're doing and so i went to my board of directors and i said i i i know like we're growing and i know that everything's going well and i know we have 10 million dollars in the bank but I want to tear it all down. I want to start over from scratch. I want to build something that actually helps people who are really looking for something find their person. Wow. And this is also, I'm just going to throw this in because you're forgetting this, but the weekend that he realized this, you like stayed up. It was Thanksgiving of 2015. It was the same weekend this article was published in the newspaper. And I remember like the last two nights we were down at your home in Louisville, Kentucky. 
you literally did not go to bed. And you just sat at the kitchen counter and you're like, I'm ripping really? down him. That's so I'm true. Doing it. it was the same Literally the day that this article came out is the day that I decided, wow, I never even put that together. Yeah. But you're welcome. So I did play a role there. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and now and now, like, not just this, but but I mean, literally hundreds of thousands of couples, tens of thousands of marriages. Uh, thousands of, of babies question. because yeah, of your, because question. of that one question and, that and you asked, and just think of like the the ripple effect of that. I oh went gosh. into the subway the other day and I saw an ad for Hinge, and it says, "This is we are the app that makes you want to uh, to get rid of our app." Designed to be deleted. Designed to be deleted. Designed to be deleted. <laughs> Thank you. Better, better than. <laughs> and I was one of the. But maybe we'll reconsider our tagline. <laughs> but I just like again. I mean, this story makes me burst out crying all the time. I'm sitting in the subway. I see the ad. And I'm like. Because <laughs> I know that he changed it after he met Kate, oh and now gosh. everybody that I talk to, all my single friends, are like, Hinge is the best because it asks you these really vulnerable questions, and you have to put yourself out there like that. And all of those prompts that, like, so he rebooted the app, and then as the app started to develop and grow with time, then the prompts came on, and that kind of tracked with, like, you know, when I first got back, everyone was like, oh, this is a fairy tale. Yeah, but it's two strangers living in, like, what, 340-square-foot studio <laughs> who hadn't seen each other in eight years. And we had a lot of work to do. So as we became more vulnerable with each other, like, literally that vulnerability is reflected on how the prompts that came on to Hinge. Oh, my gosh. I mean, that's so interesting because, the like, the most popular monologue column by far, or actually the most popular article in the New York Times, was the 36 questions, mm. you know. I love that one. <clears throat> that are all about vulnerability, and it's all about sort of putting vulnerability on an equal, you know, equal footing so that both people have to have to participate equally. Because the scariest thing is who's going to do it first or who's going to do it more or whatever. But, yeah, so those questions, which I imagine are the same kinds of things that you have as prompts, it's a game, but it's a game with integrity, and it's a game that really works. Wow. I feel like the people in this room are responsible for, like, all the love in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> and I am just blessed that. to be in there. Probably 70% of it. Right. right. Exactly. <laughs> well, I think our time is kind of up. But thank you so much for sharing this story and for you for getting this baby to be born and this all this love to... Well, I think she had a little bit more to do with getting the baby to be born. <laughs> all right, good job. I good job, back. Justin. Right. <laughs> I did. Well, thanks for sharing your story with Listeners of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Really appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you. Zibby. Thank you. Thanks again to my sponsor, Lauren Gabrielson, the women's wear brand that creates elevated essentials for the modern women's wardrobe, laurengabrielson.com. Thanks for listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. You can follow me on Instagram at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You could always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. 